Okay, today I'm going to talk about technical debt by the book, because I'm talking about it in, term, in terms of books. I'm talking about a whole series of books that I've been working on, and but the point that I want to get to is this thing about technical debt, which we'll get into as, as I get to a little bit later. Round about going through things. So originally this whole talk, this idea of the talk came about when I was just going to, I was going to pitch this book somewhere. And as I was talking about the latest book, I realized sort of how much changes we've gone through over the past years and sort of what this means. So beginning iPhone development, this first book came out in April 2009, um, 10 months after iOS 2 was released, or iPhone OS at that point. And that was the first public release that people could build software for and submit to the App Store and stuff. This book was a huge success. Um, uh, for A-Press, it broke all kinds of sales records, um, written by these two guys, Dave Mark and Jeff LaMarche. Um, had dozens of example apps and a few thousand lines of code. And it was followed quite quickly by the, by the next book, uh, Beginning iPhone 3 Development. This came out in July of the same year, just actually one month after iPhone OS 3 was released. Basically, once they saw how well the first book was doing and they realized they had some changes they had to make, they went ahead and charged forward with it with the new version. There weren't a whole lot of technical differences that they were able to they were able to sort of fix up a lot of things, keep things up in, in good shape. Uh, the next time around, I got on board with beginning iPhone 4 development. Um, and here we started to add a lot of stuff covering what was what was the things that were new in iOS 4. Um, we had coverage for iPad. Uh, doing background processing using Grand Central Dispatch and also using blocks, all these things that were sort of new to the language, new to the frameworks. This book came out about seven months after the OS was released. A big chunk of that time included that we rewrote a lot of stuff to target Xcode 4, which was quite different from Xcode 3. But by the time we were done with the book, Xcode 4 wasn't out yet. It was still sort of going to develop a preview. And the word we got from Apple was that, no, 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 you may not publish a book coming to Xcode 4 until it's out. So we had to backtrack everything back to Xcode 3, and then publish the book, and then about six weeks, two months later, Xcode 4 came out. So it's kind of a month or two of wasted time there. But anyway, that's that. Uh, the next version was the beginning Iowa side development. It came out in December 2011. This was about six months after iOS 5 was released. Here we've added, uh, we redid all of the Xcode 4 work to add that back in. Um, also added uh, some stuff about iCloud and switched the entire book over to using Arc, um, which was a pretty big change in, in sort of all the code for all the applications. We went from this sort of manual retain and release the paradigm to the automatic stuff. So there was a whole lot of work that went into just making all the updating all the examples to do the right things. Um, the next version came out in January 2013. This is beginning iOS 6 development. Uh, here, Frederick Olson came on board here in Sweden and helped me out. Um, the, uh, this, this came about four months after the OS was released. We added support for UI collection view and just cleaned up a lot of sort of general things all over the place. Um, throughout this whole time, one of the things that's also shifted all, all the way in, uh, in Objective-C has been there's Apple's been kind of adding ways to reduce the amount of code for property accessors through automatic uh, synthesized generated or synthesized getters and setters. And the syntax for this has gotten sort of easier and smaller all the time. But every well, almost every year there was something new to sort of go through all the code and, and uh, change all these things out. But have these books got this problem? No, the book's all gotten bigger <laughs> because there's there's always new stuff. We're all like you know, let's have a new chapter about collection view, new chapter about let's write kit or whatever. Uh, so this is beginning iOS seven development. This came out in March two thousand fourteen, uh, about six months after the OS was released. Um, most of that slowness was due to just the fact that this book was entirely written by me. Um, in the past, you know, some people have done other chapters. This one was all me, and I just didn't have time to do it in an orderly fashion. And here we had added Xcode 5, um, added a chapter on Sprite Kit, added stuff about auto layout, which is a new thing, which is a pretty, also a pretty big change from the way things were done before. Um, after this book was released, we noticed something that after this sort of initial sales spurt, the sales of this book just like 
drop off the bottom of, of the face of the earth. Um, it turns out that of all of these books, the one that was selling best at this time, in the spring of 2004, was the very first book, the oldest book in 2009, which is a huge problem because if you try and actually use that book, you can't use it very effectively with the latest SDKs at all. Like everything it tells you to do is all stuff that is nowadays pretty wrong. And I guess the reason for this is probably because it was, it was a big selling book. Probably people are still Googling the book title and finding this book because it's still, for some reason, it's still on Amazon. You can buy this thing. So after this, we decided to change, actually, change the name of the book. So, so we, we were dropping the iOS 7, or any sort of mention of iOS. And the, the next book is called, is called, once again, Beginning iPhone Development, as the original was called. Hopefully this works. Um, this update was done entirely by a, guy, a new guy called Kim Topley. Um, I took a break from it all, which was very nice. And he got the whole thing done just two months after the OS was released. He was able to do a lot of time to it, a lot of time to it which is good. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of new stuff in iOS 8, actually, at least not, not stuff that affected beginners. So for the beginning book, there weren't a huge amount of changes. The biggest change was probably dealing with the addition of size classes, which is a new thing. Um, new part of interface builder lets you sort of specify, we'll talk about it before a little bit, lets you specify different layouts for different screen sizes in a particular way. But of course there was, a, there was another big thing from WBC last year which was Swift, and so this actually became two books that were released at about the same time in November last year, which was cool. So um, what about technical debt? This is sort of the, the point of this whole, the whole topic. Um, technical debt, the kind of, it, it's a fairly new term. The definition is basically it's work that you haven't done, you need to do at some point. And like financial debt, technical debt seems to grow over time, kind of view it as, a, as accruing interest. So anything that you, any bad designs you have in your system will tend to generate problems that seem to get bigger as time goes by, it can be harder to fix later than they are earlier on. So one of the, one of the notions of dealing with software over a longer period of time is you have to deal with your technical debt. And this can be due to either, again, problems in your code, bugs in your code, it could be just that you, want, you need to make some improvements or adjust to, to other externalities. It can be updating the tools and languages to the latest versions of things. And so over the course of all the editions of this, of this book, I kind of went through, these are sort of the big picture stuff of all the things that, that I could think of that were, that were added over the course of all these editions. And each of these things on its own is it's pretty big, a pretty big thing to apply to a whole lot of code. So if, if we had gone from just the first version of the book from 2009 and updated to what we have today, updating all of this stuff probably would have taken a year. It's just a huge amount of stuff. It would, it would essentially be, we would be, able, be better off starting from scratch, just rewrite the book, the whole thing from scratch if we're trying to update it. So by, by updating it annually and forcing ourselves to always keep, with, keep current with Apple's cycle of tool releases, we actually keep our technical debt pretty low, which enabled, again, it enabled Kim to update the entire thing for iOS 8, including making two books out of it, and have it released in sort of record time after the OS was finally released. Um, not every one of these things is something that applies to every application, uh, but some of them are. These things that are in red are pretty much things that every application is going to need to use at some point. If, you're, and if, you, if you have an old application that you know, you know you're not adding sprite kit, it's not a game app or whatever, the other things are things that you're going to want to need to deal with at some point in order to deal with any new functionality in your code. Um, basically, if you skip any of these things, you kind of do so at your own peril because Apple tends to release things and then build upon them and build upon them. If you don't sort of keep up, it's hard to uh, jump into the new stuff. Um, I also, I didn't, I didn't mark Swift red here initially, but I want to sort of add that in because even if you have, you're talking about legacy applications that you want to maintain, if you don't keep up with what's, what's going in Swift, um, you're going to end up in kind of a technological dead end at some point because there are things that Swift can do that Objective-C can't do. So there are going to be APIs, including from Apple, that will be Swift only at some point in the future. Um, so the moral of this is that in order to keep your technical debt from rising all the time, you have to take steps to keep things in shape. And here I'm talking mainly about keeping up with tools, languages, but there are other things as well. And I found this nice graphic on Henrik Knieberg's blog, 
actually had a nice article talking about technical debt. And I kind of liked this. He had a, a series of graphs that he would made showing how, you, how your, your debt could be going up and down. And I kind of like this one. If you say that, you know, you can't, you can't have zero technical debt all the time. You have to be working with your code and doing things. And everything you do is always making changes. And um, what he means is that you need to sort of take, try and establish it for yourself a debt ceiling, like how far, how much are we willing to accept? How, how bad are we willing to let things get, you know, before we decide we have to do things? And he means over time, you'll tend to have this kind of seesaw pattern of things going up and down a bit. And so I stole this graphic. And that is all that I had to talk about today. Um, any questions? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I got it in 10 minutes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, so like Apple sort of drives the, the release cycle. Um, has that been useful? Has their, has their cycle, I don't know what their cycle is, but has their iteration cycle been good for resetting a technical debt ceiling? Or do you need some, do you recommend some other external tools? I think if you're dealing with Apple stuff, then yeah, following their cycle is, is, is pretty important. Um, and especially over time, the, their cycles become very regular. Like they always have, you know, the new iOS is available in beta form or for developers in its middle of the summer, and then it comes out in the fall. So you always have a few months to sort of digest what is new and try and apply it to your own stuff. Um, the challenge can be they're trying to determine, okay, of all this new stuff that they tell you that you see what are the things that are really sort of important and it, it's not always necessarily easy to figure it out some things are some things are easy some things are not so mm -hmm. but there are definitely you know people who got hung up on um, auto layout and said this is too big of a thing to deal with in iOS 6 we, we're not going to deal with this and then suddenly in iOS 7 you had to have it if you didn't have it in your code base you just had a big pile of work to do to, both in bringing auto layout and a, adapting for iOS 7. So it's kind of, kind of really kind of pay attention to what they're doing and keep on top of it. Just, Good to go. Gotta go. <laughs> All right.